Ambassador Eric Rubin, President of the American Foreign Service Association, is our Master of Ceremonies today. Ambassador Rubin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Theo, and good afternoon uh, to our colleagues, friends, and honored guests, and welcome to AFSA's annual award ceremony, which provides us with an occasion to recognize some of the best that the Foreign Service and our Foreign Service community have to offer. AFSA takes great pride in being able to honor the dedication, patriotism, and sheer excellence of the professional career Foreign Service. We're obviously meeting in an unusual way this year. As a result of COVID-19, we were unable to gather in person last year, and that unfortunate situation remains with us still. However, rather than ask our recipients to wait yet another year to be recognized, we decided it was right to honor our colleagues from both 2020 and this year. Their achievements deserve to be highlighted, and I thank you for joining us in this virtual format, which we all know all too well by now. I'd like to extend a special welcome to this year's recipient of AFSA's Award for Lifetime Contributions to American Diplomacy, Ambassador John Negroponte and his wife, Diana. Congratulations, and thank you for being with us today. I'm also honored that the family of Ambassador Edward Perkins, who was last year's recipient of this award, has joined us. Sadly, Ambassador Perkins passed away in late 2020. We at AFSA are privileged to have been able to bestow this award on him before his passing. I have the pleasure of welcoming and recognizing five former recipients of AFSA's lifetime, AFSA's lifetime contributions to American Diplomacy Award, Ambassadors Hank Cohen, Ruth Davis, Tom Boyett, Ron Newman, and Bill Harrop. Thank you all for all you have done and continue to do for American diplomacy and for our foreign service. And thank you for being with us here today. I also want to acknowledge the passing of three other Lifetime Award recipients over the past two years, Ambassador George Landau, Ambassador Bill Swing, and former Sec Secretary of State George Schultz. May they rest in peace. I also want to acknowledge the passing over the weekend of former Secretary of State Colin Powell. We're all aware of the many contributions he made to our nation in both military and civilian roles, but to us in the Foreign Service, he will always be remembered for the great care he showed for the people of the State Department. His tenure as Secretary has always been looked back on with great fondness and appreciation by everyone in the Foreign Service and their family members. Our condolences go to his wife Alma, to his family, and to his many friends. I know that many members of our agency leadership have been able to log on today, and I thank them for doing so. It demonstrates the support of our senior colleagues for the amazing work being recognized today. Uh, and I wish to, in particular, uh, thank and recognize Ambassador Ken Merton, the Acting Director General of the Foreign Service, for joining us uh, here today at a time when I know he's very busy preparing to go to Haiti to serve us all. Today, we have the pleasure of presenting awards for lifetime contributions, constructive dissent, and exemplary performance. Before we begin, let me briefly uh, congratulate some of AFSA's other award winners from earlier this year. Uh, Deborah Mosel, Nancy Liu, and Valerie O'Brien received the 2020 and 2021 George F. Kennett Award for Strategic Writing awarded to the Foreign Service members whose final paper at the National War College was chosen as the best essay on strategy or policy. They are not with us here today for this event, but I wanted to mention their achievement. This year, we also honored 20 winners of our Sinclair Language Awards given to those who excel in the study or use of a category three or four language at FSI. I can't name them all because we'd be here till tomorrow, but please join me in congratulating them on this achievement. And I also want to thank the sponsors of today's awards, the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation, Clements Worldwide, the Rifkin family, the Boland family, the Family Liaison Office, and the Palmer family. Thank you for your generosity and your support. And once again, thank you all for joining us here today. Our first award this afternoon is for lifetime contributions to American diplomacy. I'm honored to present this award to Ambassador John Negroponte. Ambassador Negroponte was born in London, England and was raised in New York. He received a bachelor's degree from Yale University after graduating from Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire. Following a brief time at Harvard Law School, Ambassador Negroponte joined the US Foreign Service in 1960. And he's here with his wife, uh, Diana Villiers Negroponte. 
Ambassador Negroponte held public service positions in Washington and abroad between 1960 and 1997, and again between 2001 and 2008. At the beginning of his career, he was assigned to post in Ecuador, Greece, Hong Kong, and Vietnam. In 1977, he served as a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and Fisheries. In 1980, he held the same position in the Bureau of East Asian and Pacific Affairs. Ambassador Negroponte was named Ambassador to Honduras in 1981 and held key ambassadorships in the following years, including the United Nations, Mexico, the Philippines, and Iraq. In addition to serving as an ambassador for many years, he served on the National Security Council twice, first as the director for Vietnam in the Nixon administration, and then as deputy national security advisor under President Reagan. In 2005, following his ambassadorship to Iraq, Ambassador Negroponte held a cabinet level position as the first director of national intelligence under President Bush. This position was created in the wake of the September 11, 2001 events and aimed to centralize the leadership of US intelligence agencies. In 2007, Ambassador Negroponte became deputy secretary of state where he served as the State Department's Chief Operating Officer until the end of President Bush's term, marking the end of his time in government positions. During his Foreign Service career, Ambassador Negroponte received the highest award that can be conferred by the Secretary of State, the State Department Secretary's Distinguished Award Service Award on two occasions. In 2005, he received the Raymond Chit Trainer Award for Distinction in the Conduct of Diplomacy, from Georgetown University's Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. In 2006, he was the American Academy of Diplomacy's Golden Platt Award recipient. That same year, Ambassador Negroponte was presented the George F. Kennan Award for Distinguished Public Service by the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. Finally, in 2009, Ambassador Negroponte was awarded the National Security Medal by President Bush. Following his retirement from his career in public service, Ambassador Negroponte was presented with two additional awards for his invaluable contributions to diplomacy. In 2014, he received the Distinguished Service Award for the Advancement of Public, Public Discourse on Foreign Policy by the American Committee on Foreign Relations. And in 2019, he was chosen as the Walter and Leonor Annenberg Award recipient for excellence in diplomacy by the American Academy of Diplomacy. After retiring from the State Department, Ambassador Negroponte taught international relations at Yale's Jackson Institute and at the Elliott School for International Affairs at GW. From 2018 to 2019, Ambassador Negroponte was the James Schlesinger Distinguished Professor at the University of Virginia's Miller Center. Ambassador Negroponte serves as Chairman Emeritus of the Council of the Americas and Americas Society. He is also the Co-Chairman of the U.S. Philippine Society and a past member of the Secretary of State's Foreign Affairs Policy Board. He has also served as Chairman of the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. John, on behalf of all of us, congratulations on this truly important career of service to our country uh, and service in the interest of diplomacy, of peace, and of a better world. And with that, uh, I want to thank you for joining us and accepting this award. And I'd like to turn the microphone over to you. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Eric, for the kind introduction and for this very meaningful award. Uh, let me first of all echo uh, what you had to say about Colin Powell. He was much beloved uh, in the Department of State and of course in the military and in the National Security Council. He was, uh, oh, here comes. Uh, here comes the usual. <laughs> well, here, <laughs> Diana is being helpful with the, the lighting effects here. Very good, thank you. <laughs> uh, Co uh, back, back to Colin Powell. Uh, let me just say that I had, uh, before going into my prepared remarks, uh, I had three different occasions in my career to work uh, directly for Colin. First, uh, as Deputy National Security Advisor. Secondly, as Permanent Representative to the United Nations. And third, uh, as uh, Ambassador to Iraq. And what really struck me about General Powell was his hands-on approach to leadership of whatever institution he uh, 
uh, was in charge of. And uh, in those two jobs as perm rep in New York and ambassador to Iraq, he called me practically every single day uh, to go over whatever uh, uh, we needed to talk about. Uh, sometimes the calls were just uh, as brief as just to ask me how I was doing. But uh, he was uh, truly a hands-on uh, leader and I really appreciated the personal interactions that I had with him over practically a, a, a four or five year period. Uh, secondly, on the personal front, Colin was, pers uh, was considerate, he was compassionate, and uh, above all, I think he was very uh, concerned for the well-being of his team, whether they were military or civilian. And in, in uh, the case of my assignment to uh, Iraq, he also showed a, a great concern uh, for uh, my own uh, family and uh, their well-being uh, as they knew that uh, it was a hardship as it was for anybody serving in Iraq at that time under conditions of a sep uh, separated tour. So uh, all the good things that have been said about Cole and I had many occasions yesterday to speak on TV about him. He was a wonderful man and I'm gonna miss him uh, sorely. And uh, of course I join with you and the others who have extended their sincerest uh, condolences to uh, his wife, Alma, and to his entire family. Now, Eric is president of AFSA, an organization which has been promoting the greater effectiveness and well being of our foreign service for close to a century. You stand on the shoulders of American diplomatic giants who also served as AFSA presidents, such as George Kennan, Robert Murphy and Chip Boland, just to mention a few. So I, at, at the outset, wanna thank you for what you and your team uh, do every day to advance foreign service interests. I had a very fortunate government career, 44 years in all. I held nine senatorially confirmed positions under five different presidents and got to know every Secretary of State since the Nixon administration. There were many highlights. Uh, prominent among them were the opportunities to serve on the NSC staff under Dr. Henry Kissinger in the 1970s. And again, under General uh, Colin Powell, as I've just mentioned at the end of the Reagan administration. Later as Director of National Intelligence, I developed a close working relationship with George W. Bush who gave me extraordinary opportunities to serve the country, not only as DNI, but also as ambassador to Iraq, permanent representative to the United Nations and deputy secretary of state. Interestingly, uh, working in some of these high sounding jobs were not necessarily the ones which brought the greatest personal satisfaction. I had two stints in the Bureau of Oceans and International environmental and scientific affairs, uh, known as OES, totaling five years. We were involved in literally dozens of negotiations ranging from law of the sea to science cooperation with the Soviets to fisheries management and conservation issues around the world, including Antarctica. I'm particularly proud of two accomplishments in the OES Bureau. First, was the negotiation in 1978 of vastly improved protection for valuable Alaskan uh, salmon stocks from Japanese high sea fishing, an agreement I personally negotiated as Deputy Assistant Secretary with the government of Japan and Canada, and which ultimately led to Japan ceasing the practice of catching other people's salmon on the high seas. And second, as uh, Assistant Secretary of that very same Bureau in 1987, I led the interagency effort to support the negotiation by my deputy, Richard Benedict, of the Montreal Pro Protocol for the Protection of the Stratospheric Ozone Layer, the only global greenhouse gas agreement that has ever been successfully negotiated and ratified by the Senate. One other diplomatic outcome which I look back upon with satisfaction was the achievement 
of a North American free trade agreement, the NAFTA, while I was ambassador to Mexico. Although I was not the negotiator, I accompanied the negotiating uh, the negotiation pretty much every step of the way and believe I was instrumental in persuading uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush to pursue such an agreement in the first place. Reflecting back on these years of work, I believe the Foreign Service has stepped up in ways that were truly above and beyond the call of duty. As a junior officer in Vietnam, I recall when President Johnson decreed in 1965 that henceforth entire entering classes of the Foreign Service would be deployed to Vietnam for rural development and other nation building tasks. Likewise, as ambassador to Iraq, where FSO served in the embassies, the branch offices, and the provincial reconstruction teams, we can be justifiably proud of the way our officers and staff have stood side by side with our military brothers and sisters in times of danger. For me personally, the chance to work at close quarters with our military, whether in Vietnam, Iraq or elsewhere, has been amongst the most rewarding experiences of my life. I wouldn't trade away any of those 44 years they were everything and more than I had any reason or right to expect when I entered the State Department building for the first time that day in October, 1960. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. And um, on behalf of all of us, once again, congratulations again, and thank you for all your accomplishments on behalf of our country and the world uh, in the service of our country and in the practice of diplomacy. And I do hope we'll be able to present the award in person uh, someday soon. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, turn to a few words in honor of Ambassador Perkins who was selected for this honor last year. And unfortunately we were not able to honor him last year at the height of COVID. Uh, but a few words, uh, if I may. Uh, Ambassador Perkins was born in Sterlington, Louisiana and grew up in Portland, Oregon. He passed away on November 7th, 2020. Ambassador Perkins earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Maryland and a master's and doctor, doctorate of public administration from the University of Southern California. He served three years in the US Army and four years in the US Marine Corps. Ambassador Perkins was married to the former Lucy Chengmei Lu. They had two daughters, Catherine and Sarah, both of whom are with us here today. Thank you for joining us and four grandchildren. In 1972, Ambassador Perkins was assigned as a staff assistant in the office of the Director General of the Foreign Service. He then went on to work as a personnel officer in the State Department's Bureau of Personnel, as it was called then. Following this assignment, he was assigned to the Bureau of Far East and South Asian Affairs, as it was called, and thereafter served in the Office of Management Operations. In 1978, he was assigned to the U.S. Embassy in Accra, Ghana, as Counselor for Political Affairs, then was named Deputy Chief of Mission to the American Embassy in Monrovia, Liberia in 1981. He then served as Director of the Department of State's Office of West African Affairs, and in 1985, he was appointed ambassador to Liberia. One year later in 1986, he was appointed as ambassador to the Republic of South Africa, where he served from 1986 to 1989. In 1989, Ambassador Perkins was appointed director general of the Foreign Service and director of personnel in the Department of State. In 1992, he was appointed US ambassador to the United Nations and as US representative in the UN Security Council. And then uh, he took up his post as ambassador to Australia before finally retiring on August 31st, 1996 with the rank of career minister. Following his retirement from the Foreign Service, Ambassador Perkins also served on the boards of the Cranlana program in Melbourne, Australia, the steering committee for the Center for Australia-New Zealand Studies at Georgetown, 
the advisory board of the Institute for International Public Policy, the advisory council to the University Office of International Programs at Penn State, the advisory board of the Thursday Luncheon Group, the board of trustees of the Woodrow Wilson National Fellowship Foundation, the board of visitors of the National Defense University, the board of directors of the National Academy for Public Administration, and as a life trustee of Lewis and Clark College in Portland, Oregon. In recognition of his remarkable life and career, all of us at AFSA were thrilled to honor him with our Lifetime Achievement Award last year. Uh, and I'd like to ask his daughter, Catherine, who's with us here today, along with her sister, uh, to make a few remarks about her father and this award. Catherine. Thank you, Ambassador Rubin, for your kind and thoughtful remarks. And congratulations to Ambassador Negroponte on receiving the 2021 Lifetime Contributions Award. On behalf of my sister, Sarah Perkins, and our extended family, I want to thank the American Foreign Service Association for nominating my father, Edward Joseph Perkins, for the 2020 Lifetime Contributions to American Diplomacy Award. To say that he was pleased and honored that he was recipient of this award was an understatement. He spent the summer in, in 2020 before he died, talking about his life in great detail, contemplating not only his foreign service career, but the other professions and institutions that had shaped his vision and gave him the tools to become a successful diplomat and scholar. The path that took him to the State Department was not the path that his grandfather and others envisioned him for as his child. Growing up in Northern Louisiana, our great grandfather, Nathan Noble, regarded our father as the heir who would eventually take over the family farm. Yet his grandmother, Sarah Elizabeth Noble, who could not read or write, but who raised him with plenty of tough love and was a great influence in his formative years, pushed him to seek more. Throughout his life, he talked about her often and would continue to draw upon her wisdom and guidance when challenges arose. Our father was always seeking ways to expand his knowledge. He often told us that as a child, he used books to extend the space around him. And as he grew older and had access to different authors, the books became a broad avenue to the world. He loved philosophy and religion and was fascinated with the works of Plato, Socrates, Sun Tzu, Hobbes, Machiavelli, Martin Luther King, and Thomas Merton. Our father was always giving us books or recommending articles for us to read. He wanted us to better understand the country where we came from, particularly given that we had lived most of our childhood abroad, and gave us books written by authors such as Willa Cather and Langston Hughes to give us a broad represent representation of American society. He continued to be a voracious reader up until his last days, always seeking to grow as a person and always trying to improve and expand his horizons. As Ambassador Rubin said, as a young man, he did, expend his, he did expand his horizons, first by joining the army and then the Marines, serving in Korea and Japan, and then as a civilian with the military. He met and fell in love with our mother, Lucy Ching Mei Liu in Taipei, Taiwan. He always credited her strength and steady support for his success as a foreign service officer. Our father succeeded as a foreign service officer because people believed in him and were willing to help him with his quest to become a diplomat and make a positive impact on professional and personal level. He had a number of close friends and colleagues who supported him and provided the advice needed to help accomplish his goals. He cherished the men and women of the foreign and civil service, but he always asked how the State Department could fully represent the United States when it did not represent all of its people. With help from colleagues and support from Congress, he convinced the department to create programs that would diversify the foreign service, focusing on those who are underrepresented and who might not otherwise have the opportunity to consider the foreign service as a career. These opportunities now known as the Pickering and Wrangle programs have brought a cadre of dedicated professionals who bring their own vision, intelligence, curiosity, and desire to make a positive impact on the world. After my father passed away, many Pickering and Wrangle fellows shared their experiences with us and these narratives of the courage and the desire to do more with their lives sustained us during the difficult time. Our father's story had become their stories. 
If he were here today, he would be proud of these fellows and the contributions they are making, not only to the Foreign Service, but to our nation's success. There are many highlights from his diplomatic career that he would define as making an impact, not only on his own life, but on the lives of others as well. One of his greatest challenges was his appointment as the first black US ambassador to South Africa. He faced opposition here in the US and in South Africa, receiving threatening letters and public condemnation. During this time, he recalled the advice his grandmother gave him as a child when facing racism. Always remember you are better than they are. That assignment came to symbolize for him what it meant to be a foreign service officer and to make a difference. He visited townships, attended funerals and trials for black South Africans who were seeking justice for themselves and for the people. He reached out to other racial groups and engaged them in difficult conversations, seeking to better understand the divisions within the country and to help them find solutions. Even when his efforts couldn't directly free a prisoner or loosen unjust restrictions, he wanted people to know that the United States would continue to advocate for them when they needed support. He received a letter from Patrick Lakota, Popo Malefe, and Mas Chikane, members of the United Democratic Front, who were charged with treason and whose trial was about to come to an end when, with what was expected to be a harsh sentence. The letter said, we are writing to convey our final gratitude to you and your staff for all the warmth, deep concern, and general sympathy you showed us and our families during these three and a half years of trial. The presence of all of you on those days when your tight schedules allowed you to come provided us with a measure of reassurance. We always felt that with your presence would somehow force our captors to observe the necessary decorum. But above all, your company during the brief and boisterous adjournments gave us a sense of belonging and of community. Your kind words immensely fortified us when we realized from them that the world beyond the borders of our country is filled with millions of people who understand the agony of our lives under apartheid. Our faith in humankind was therefore greatly strengthened. The words and feelings expressed in this letter is one of the many reasons that my father joined the Foreign Service. Our father was always grateful for the life he lived. He strongly believed in self-determination and education and was fiercely optimistic. When my son Nathan was born, he wrote a letter to him that captured his enthusiasm for life. He wrote, at a time when it is just great to be alive, at least in my opinion, it is wonderful to be in the position of having a ringside seat. Our world has always undergone change constantly, but it just seems now that it is moving faster with great results, sometimes disastrous results, presenting challenges, new learning experiences, a new way of life, and the opportunity to excel or not, and to make a mark that is lasting as to its effect on humanity. He continued to imbue this optimism with Nathan and his other grandchildren, Robbie, Sophia, and Caden, all of whom he loved and expressed great pride in as a grandfather. He was 92 when he died last November, but I'm sure the sentiments he expressed in a letter he wrote to me when he turned 70 would be similarly expressed if he was here today to receive this award. He said, to say that I'm pleased is not to make it dramatic enough. To say that I'm blessed is to make a more dramatic statement. I'll end this by saying that I've had a great life, but it would have been an empty life without the fullness of these experiences, feelings, and teach teachings occasioned thereby. My sister and I and our families thank you again for this award that recognizes and celebrates his accomplished career and the initiatives that he put forth to improve and strengthen the institution that he was proud to be of, to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine and Sarah. And let me just express on behalf of all of us, our gratitude for the opportunity uh, to recognize your late father and his tremendous contributions to our service, to our country, uh, and his role as, as a model, I think, for all of us. And uh, we're so glad that you could join us today uh, and, again, not present the award in person as we would have wished to, but at least uh, to, to honor him as, as we very much 
wish to. So thank you again for joining us and for, for sharing those wonderful reminiscences. Um, we now uh, should move on to our award for exemplary performance, which allow us to honor colleagues for going above and beyond their duties and responsibilities for the betterment of our work environment, our relations with host countries, and our overall foreign policy. The first award is the Avis Boland Award for an eligible family member. And I'd like to ask Ambassador Avis Boland to present these awards, which are named after her late mother. Avis. Thank you, Eric. Um, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to present the Avis Bolin Award, which was established, as you mentioned, by the, the late Ambassador Pamela Harriman in honor of my mother, who was the wife of a Foreign Service officer in a very different era. The purpose of the award was to honor the spouses, which in those days meant wives, of Foreign Service officers whom Ambassador Harriman rightly considered to be the unsung foot soldiers of our embassies abroad. Expectations for foreign service spouses or partners today are vastly different than they were in my mother's day. And the award is now given to a family member who can be a man as well as a woman, a partner as well as a spouse. But the spirit behind the award remains the same, which is to honor the contribution and service of those who accompany FSOs or others in US government service overseas, particularly those who have strengthened ties with the, lo with the local communities of the country in which they are assigned. Today, we will honor three recipients of the award. The first was voted winner of the award in 2020, but because the pandemic prevented there being any ceremony is receiving it only today. Rick Bassett is an award-winning professional composer and orchestrator with numerous Broadway credits who receives the award for providing his American, Liberian and international colleagues in Monrovia a hardship post with limited external activities with, as the citation states, numerous joyful interludes. And I would now like to um, pause and let Rick Bassett deliver his remarks and then go on to name the two winners of this year's award. Thank you, Ambassador Bolin, uh, for uh, your mother's inspiration for this award and that of your family and for your kind introduction. And thank you very much to the American Foreign Service Association for sponsoring this award for EFMs an unexpected but very gratifying role that I've performed for the past 30 years now. As a Foreign Service spouse, I salute my fellow and sister EFMs for all that they do to support US missions around the world, from volunteer work to community and school leadership, to raising families and pursuing independent careers while moving post to post. I give special appreciation to Ambassador Christine Elder for nominating me and for her dedicated and thoughtful leadership of the U.S. Embassy in Monrovia and the cohesive community she fostered and encouraged. I'm grateful to everyone in the Embassy Monrovia community for their enthusiasm and spirit, particularly during the challenges presented by COVID-19 to gatherings, volunteer work, and outreach. We were privileged to meet many Liberians during our three years in Monrovia and were inspired by their res resilience and friendship. I particularly thank the Liberian musicians I had the honor to work with, who bring such talent and dedication to their craft and their art. One of my fondest memories from the past three years was the chance to discover Nina Simone's song, Liberian Calypso, and perform it with Liberian singer Tanya Garnett and her band, which we did on numerous occasions. I also was inspired to work with the embassy choir that came together to perform on LE Staff Appreciation Day. I say the biggest thank you of all to my spouse, Alison Grunder, who was the DCM and Charge in Monrovia during our tour there, and to our now grown up children, Corey and Liam, for an amazing lifetime spent all over the world. Thank you. So to go on to the, um, this year's two awardees, 2021 was, as we all remember, a year dominated by the pandemic. 
For many of our embassies overseas, the increased isolation and heightened anxiety made life particularly difficult. And so in choosing this year's awardees, and we gave the price to two people, we prioritized the work of those who helped embassy communities to weather these difficult months. First, as head of the American Community Support Association in New Delhi, during one of the longest and most restrictive lockdowns in one of the world's hardest hit countries. Amanda Yeager continued to make the association services available to the diplomatic community under the most challenging conditions from ensuring grocery deliveries to those in quarantine to serving as the embassy's mental health ambassador. The second awardee this year was um, Ivana Lawrence, who as head of the Parent Teachers Organization at the Principal American School in Cairo, contributed significantly to maintaining staff morale during the chaos and social isolation of the pandemic. Her tireless efforts helped the international community to stay connected with one another to maintain the quality of the school experience while it was operating remotely and to assuage the anxieties of those who were transferred to the embassy in Cairo in the middle of the pandemic. So I would like to in invite first Amanda and then Ivana to deliver their remarks. Thank you so much, Ambassador Bolin. Um, and I also wanna thank AFSA for this recognition. Um, it is my honor to accept this award today. I also would like to share this with all of the EFMs who stepped up during the pandemic and worked tirelessly to put the hard work in to help out. This is for all of us. I'm so grateful for the opportunity that was offered being posted in New Delhi. It was our first post. It was my husband's first assignment. We had spent years in the military and then joined the State Department. Um, and that once we arrived in Delhi, we fell in love with AXA, the American Community Support Association. It was a safe harbor. And being elected to sit on the board and then as vice president, by my peers was truly gratifying. Knowing what we did on the board would make a difference and ease the pain of the pandemic was its own reward. All the while ensuring that we were operating safely so that we could mitigate COVID transmission so that people could find some solace and recharge so that they could focus on the work ahead was no small feat, but we did it. And during my tenure, we had no COVID cases at AXA. Helping to start the inclusivity initiative to make sure that our commissary and all of our activities reflected all the members of our community was the highlight of everything that I did. We started stocking hair and skincare products for our community of color and purchased items from black owned businesses. This is one of the things I am most proud of because it continues in my absence and helps the current and new people that will arrive at post. Getting to help out at the school was also an incredible honor. I am a fierce advocate for our son who has ADHD and trying to ease the transition for other families that are entering this new reality was a task I did not take lightly. I will continue this work for as long as there is a need. I did all of this while having my kids at home during doing virtual school and trying to make the most of that hard situation, just like every other family around the world, trying to navigate life through the pandemic. I especially want to thank my family, my husband, Nick, my children, Alex and Jack, for being understanding when I was incredibly busy and getting called away to handle whatever was thrown my way, especially my husband, who was also working tirelessly to help American citizens during the repatriation flights from India back home to America during the pandemic. It truly was a group effort. I also want to thank the AXA staff and my fellow board members, especially Matthew Colson, who was the president of AXA and one of my dear friends, uh, who also hosted Trivia Night with me as well. 
I'm truly grateful that I had the opportunity to be part of such a wonderful community at Post. It means more than I can express that our hard work as EFMs is recognized and honored. That is what it is to be part of the State Department. We are a family and we all work together. Thank you. Ivana. Gali, everyone, what a wonderful experience this is to hear these beautiful stories. I'm honored and humbled at the same time to be here tonight. I'm so thankful to you, Ambassador Bolin. I'm thankful to AFSA for having this opportunity for, for this award that you have bestowed upon me. And uh, when I thought about something that I um, can say tonight, really what came to my heart is this thought that none of us, and it's really visible from all these um, speeches that we hear tonight, <clears throat> nobody accomplishes anything without a huge team of those who made us, of those who made us realize that we had wings and uh, those who encouraged us to fly higher, um, those who understood our vision and rolled up their sleeves and opened up their hearts and started working with us, alongside with us. For all of that I am today, for all that I have achieved to deserve this beautiful award, um, I really owe huge thanks to um, many people, most of whom are here tonight with us. First and foremost, my husband, um, then my sons and my mother who all live here and share this uh, wonderful adventure of a life that we have. And then my uh, friends from the PTO in Cairo American College, most of whom are here again with us tonight, Tatiana, Nina, Sara, Mariam, Erika, Sirisha, Salma. Also the school administration with Dr. Jared Harris, all of the principals, the teachers, but also supporting staff all the way down to, you know, janitors, they all really helped whenever we um, organized events, whenever we had to think of new, creative, pragmatic ideas for how to bring the community together, everyone, everyone contributed. And that beauty of diversity um, really shone through all of our activities. And I would like to also extend a special thanks to the US Cairo mission, to our embassy there, and in particular to Margaret Fryer, who uh, at the time worked at the CLO office and has now moved on um, to DC for language training and she's off to new adventures. Huge thanks to everyone. And uh, we really are a powerhouse. And I'm so, so happy that you give us this award and really showcase us. You know, we are often those trailing spouses. We are often a little bit um, in the shadows, but we are a powerhouse and we can do so much good when given the opportunity. Um, so thank you. And let's keep this light going and growing for everyone. Thank you. All right, thank you very, very much. Let me congratulate our uh, award recipients for your tremendous work. And thank you, Ambassador Bolin, uh, for uh, presenting the awards and for your work in honor of your late mother uh, to recognize these important contributions that make so much difference to all of us and our communities overseas. Uh, now I'd like to turn to uh, Ambassador Bill Harrop, one of the founders of the Modern American Foreign Service Association, uh, to present the Nelson B. Delwan Award for exemplary performance by office management specialists. Uh, over to Bill, thank you. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, my wife and I founded or set up this uh, award uh, 27 years ago. And we did it because the career that I had in the Foreign Service really depended very much on the professional support of a series of superb Foreign Service office management specialists. And uh, in fact, in, uh, in my view, that position is critical to, Amer to American professional diplomacy. Uh, and uh, I think the office management specialist role, which has become perhaps, if anything, more important in recent years, uh, is, uh, is a very significant part 
of the Foreign Service and Professional Diplomacy. The winner of our award, uh, which is uh, to honor uh, an outstanding office management specialist annually uh, for 2020 was Jennifer McCoy, uh, who was in the office of the regional security officer in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, she was, uh, as I think we'll often find in looking at the office management specialists, uh, beyond office duties, uh, she was really something of a leader of the community involved in a great many community activities. She was in fact the, the chairman or the president of the board of directors of the, uh, uh, <clears throat> of the uh, uh, American Employee Recreation Association of Colombo, which uh, really was the center of social life and non-office activities in that, uh, in that community. At the time of the terrorist attacks in Sri Lanka, which were very considerable bombings, uh, she was a uh, excellent part of the embassy's response. She uh, followed the welfare of collected lists of how everyone stood after the, after the bombings. Uh, she personally cared for a, a badly wounded employee. Uh, and uh, later on, uh, when a whole series of TDY uh, officers came to Colombo uh, because of the, uh, of the terrorist attacks. She was a control officer really of repeatedly of these folk uh, and uh, took care of, uh, uh, took care of their, of their uh, welfare and uh, helped them to, uh, to become effective in Colombo. Uh, her skills as a office management specialist were particularly uh, seen when she went off for a series of, of several months to work for the ambassador in DCM in Colombo. Uh, uh, and the RSO reported that he had a very difficult time getting her back to the office of the uh, secure, to the RSO's office. So uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, congratulations on this award, which you've really earned in every respect. And uh, we look forward to hearing a word from you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Ambassador. That's so kind of you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, thank you to AFSA uh, for sponsoring this award um, and to those who participated in selecting me as a recipient. Um, it means a great deal to me to have my name included in any conversation mm -hmm. that highlights the work of the Great Office Management Specialist Corps and that also focuses on making our State Department a community-centric forum. Um, my deepest thanks and appreciation go out to Jason Williams, um, and my colleagues at U.S. Embassy Colombo in 2019 and 2020, who took the time and effort to draft this nomination and who wanted to see me recognized. More than any award that these people who I admire and consider true mentors and teammates would push me forward in such a way, truly humbles me and honors me. It was my privilege to work alongside them to maintain the security of the embassy and its personnel. The team I was fortunate enough to lead in ARAC, our employee association in Colombo, is just top drawer in every sense. Uh, together with the manager, uh, Anthony, and the exceptional staff there, along with some exceptional board members, uh, we were able to do so much good for the morale and well-being of our embassy community, both, both through the time of the bombing and through and into the pandemic. Um, I'll always carry with pride and with gratitude the memories of working with such strong team. I couldn't do what I do without the love and support of my own family. I thank them all for their unwavering constancy in my life. Um, particularly, I'd like to thank my dad, Warren, and my sons, Brendan and Aiden, sorry. <laughs> I, think, I think most especially my husband, Shannon, whose commitment to duty uh, inspires me every day. 
thank you again for this tremendous honor. And I want to also wish to the 2020, 2021 winner of this award, my heartiest congratulations. Thank you so much again. Thanks very much, Jenny. Uh, let me say a word now about the winner of the uh, 2021 Delavan Award, uh, Bridget Huercop. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I don't know uh, Bridget uh, personally. Uh, she was the uh, office management specialist in the political economic section of uh, Embassy Dhaka in Bangladesh. Uh, once again, we find that uh, during these last two years, uh, the uh, difficulties of, uh, of both uh, the pandemic and also of terrorism have played quite a part in the life of embassies and in the work of uh, the recipients of these awards. Uh, uh, she uh, uh, helped to organize and staff a special command center uh, in uh, in uh, Dhaka uh, at the time of the pandemic and uh, was instrumental in embassy support for uh, people suffering from that, uh, from that awful disease. Uh, when at the time uh, of the pandemic, over 2000 American citizens had to be evacuated from Dhaka and uh, Bridget was uh, the one who organized uh, that operation along with the uh, consular section, arranging the air permissions and the timing of flights and the organization of the departure of that huge number, seven flights altogether of American citizens. Uh, all in all, Bridget was regarded, and I think this is a very nice way to put it, uh, as the central calming figure in Embassy Dhaka. So, uh, Brigitte, congratulations, and you very well earned this award. Thank you, Ambassador Hara, for your kind introduction, and congratulations to you, Jennifer, on your award. I am humbled to share this honor with you. Thank you to the American Foreign Service Association as well for your continued commitment and to recognize and celebrate the many contributions of those that serve. It is a tremendous privilege to be selected as the recipient of the 2021 Nelson B. Delavan Award. And I greatly appreciate AFSA's support and the, recogn the recognition presented by Ambassador Miller and the leadership team in DACA. I am extremely grateful to receive this prestigious award. And while the nomination highlights my contributions, I think about the many colleagues around the globe who continue to work tirelessly to support their missions, the people they serve and each other during this pandemic. It is such an honor to serve in the Foreign Service during this unprecedented time, while also experiencing the privilege of what it means to truly come together, and even during a crisis, continue to inspire and support one another to reach new heights. I am extremely fortunate to have worked alongside amazing IT colleagues who swiftly navigated from virtual platforms, and with Ambassador Miller, DCM Wagner, Don Shreppel, Cindy Greco, and the entire DACA community, whose, whose determination and commitment to making a difference in the lives of others also made a significant impact in mine. I would like to also express my sincere gratitude to the many excellent OMSs for consistently sharing their collective wisdom. I am proud to be part of the OMS Corp, and, with a, and without their constant support, I would not have been able to achieve this significant honor. And finally, to the most important person of all, a special thanks to my supportive husband who takes care of the loved ones back at home while constantly cheering me on. I love you, thank you so much. And to ASA for your work on behalf of all that serve and congratulations to all the award recipients here today. May we continue to strive to be our best and thank you again for all your support. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you uh, so much, um, 
Bill for presenting those awards. Congratulations to our recipients uh, for everything you've done. We know that the past two years have been especially hard on our foreign service families, our foreign service communities, and the kind of work you've done has really made a difference for so many people and really serves as, as a model for uh, how we can manage these difficult times together. So thank you uh, and congratulations. And thank you again, uh, Bill, for everything you've done uh, for AFSA and for all of us. And uh, now I'd like to turn to John Clements uh, to present the M. Juanita Guess Award for Exemplary Performance by a Community Liaison Officer. And um, also just wanna also thank uh, John for the contributions of uh, Clements and Company and the Clements family over the years to AFSA and to our, our foreign service. So thank you. And with that, over to John. Thank you, everybody. Um, on behalf of my late mother and Juanita Guess, um, uh, it, it's just such a privilege to be here and honor the tremendous work that Close do. The, the 2020 award going to uh, Jennifer Malden. And I just uh, to extract a few comments from the wonderful write-ups that were done. Um, Jennifer is the best CLO I've worked with in my career. She cares deeply about the community and acts as my unofficial DCM and advisor, in addition to doing all the CLO things extremely well. Jennifer was at the heart of many mission successes, Every officer involved listened to Jennifer when she had guidance to offer. Jennifer is the model definition of a leader. Her creativity, positive spirit, and willingness to try new things, even during the most adverse circumstances, sets her far apart from all. Really, really tremendous. The write-up was extensive, uh, and I wanted to keep it short with a few comments. Let me turn that over to you, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Mr. Clements. I was so honored to receive the 2020 M. Juanita Guest Award. It is, it's clear that I was just one of many community liaison officers who were working hard to build strong communities and support all of our diverse community members. I'm, I'm thankful that AFSA and Clements Worldwide take the time to recognize how important CLO is in the embassy and the consulate world. Um, I also wanna give a shout out to those who served with me during my two years in Karachi. They are really the ones who made this award possible from the, the leadership, the senior leadership and the supervisors who supported some big crazy ideas to the RSO team who helped see what was possible in our very unique security environment to everyone at POST who was willing to show up. Um, they showed up not just for events, but they showed up to contribute ideas, time, their own expertise, um, their positive attitude to the CLO program, and really to the idea of community building. Karachi truly um, just was an amazing posting, and it was my honor to serve as CLO to such a remarkable team. So thank you very much, and back to you, Mr. Clements. Well, thank you for those kind words. Um, our 2021 award recipient, Elise Sargent in Beijing, and I'm going to again read a few uh, extractions from her write up and highlights. Elise Sargent is the best flow I have seen. Seems to be a shared competition here. This is not just my opinion, but the opinion, uh, the opinion of many colleagues across Embassy Beijing. A typical comment from this year's ICA-SS survey, the CLO team in Beijing is absolutely amazing. As the first post to experience COVID-19, Mission China has led the department in dealing with the pandemic evacuation. Elisa shared her experience with CLOs all around the world. Embassy Beijing is now, again, a thriving community Thanks to Alicia Sargent's leadership as CLO. And now I'll turn it over to you for your comments. And congratulations. 
Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Clements, for your coined words and, of course, for upholding this award in honor of your mother. In full honesty, I'm still surprised to be considered for this award, let alone being fortunate enough to be honored with it. I was incredibly lucky to work with an amazing cast of characters during my time in Beijing, including fellow clothes all throughout Mission China. So I just like to use this time namely to express my gratitude. It was truly inspiring to be surrounded by people who were a whole lot smarter and more accomplished than me that pushed me to be the best servant to the community that I could be. Everything that we accomplished was made possible through the love and support of the incredible Beijing community, including a few phenomenal female leaders that I'd like to take a moment to recognize. Uh, this includes my MCM, Catherine Munchmeyer, fellow Hong Kong Task Force colleagues, Brenda Kane and Kristen Gilmore. And of course, on my CLO team, Catherine Adelukin, Emily Henry, and Mei Yan Liu. Finally, I'd like to thank my loving and kind husband, Mark, who was always there to either offer me sound advice or for a glass of wine or both when they were needed, when it was difficult. Uh, without their guidance, their wisdom, and their commitment to bringing back families safely to Mission China, none of the projects or works we'd hoped to make happen would have become a reality. I'm incredibly grateful for this award. It represents a special opportunity to contribute to Mission China during such an historic time and to all of the clothes across the whole world who work hard for their communities every day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, John, uh, for your support for this award. Congratulations to both our award recipients and thank you for everything you've done for our communities overseas and for the the example you've set uh, for our clothes. Uh, and now uh, I have the pleasure to honor uh, the recipients of the Award for Achievement and Contributions to our association, which recognizes an active duty or retired AFSA member of any of the foreign affairs agencies represented by AFSA, who has made a significant non-monetary contribution to the association. Our 2020 winner is Jason Bordestrasse. Over the last few years, Jason has made it his mission to correct the historical record and ensure that all of his colleagues who have lost their lives in the line of duty are honored. During his research, Jason uncovered more than 40 names not previously honored and brought them to AFSA's attention for inscription. Through his tireless efforts to preserve the memory of formerly forgotten fellow diplomats, Jason has made a clear and weighty contribution, not only to AFSA as an association, but to the Foreign Service we love and honor. Jason, congratulations and thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Rubin. Um, and thank you to AFSA for this award. I would like to first congratulate the uh, 2021 recipient, Ambassador Tom Boyett. It's humbling to receive an award that has been presented to people like him, as well as Janice Elmore, Ambassador Bill Harrop, and Shirley Pinkham. Over 13 years ago, I was riding in a carpool to the consulate in Hong Kong when my colleague Paul Stronsky told me that there was a U.S. consul's grave at the Stanley Military Cemetery. That statement had a huge impact on my life. In addition to learning about the life and death of Russ Engdahl, who died as a prisoner in World War II, I soon, I soon discovered that there were many other diplomats who died in the line of duty, but who weren't yet commemorated on the AFSA memorial plaques. Eventually, as Ambassador Rubin noted, I found more than 40 other diplomats were now honored on the new plaques in the C Street lobby that were unveiled earlier this year. It is gratifying to see those names etched in stone and to receive this award. I would like to thank Ambassador Joe Donovan and Steve Maloney for their encouragement in the early stages of this project. I would also like to express my gratitude to John Nayland, without whom the new plaques would not exist. I would also like to thank Ed Cox for nominating me for this award. Finally, I would like to thank my parents, my sister, and my family for their love and support. Congratulations again, Jason, and thank you for your initiative. This is an enormously important project, and obviously it will stay with us uh, for decades uh, to come uh, in the C Street lobby and in our online uh, list of our colleagues uh, who gave their lives. So thank you very, very much for taking this initiative on behalf of all of us. Uh, now, as Jason previewed, I'd like to uh, welcome and salute the 2021 recipient of the same award. Uh, since receiving this same award uh, 20 years ago in 2001, 
Ambassador Thomas Boyett has continued to support and contribute to AFSA's goals. In the past 20 years, he has led four major innovations that have strengthened AFSA's role as the voice of the Foreign Service. During his time serving as AFSA treasurer, he encouraged the association to create a political action committee of which he became treasurer for six years. In 2002, Ambassador Boyett also thought to bring together foreign service related organizations to create the Foreign Affairs Council. Since 2002, he has served as the council's president and advocates for funding for diplomacy and development before Senate subcommittees and committees, reports, press conferences and meetings with senior State Department and other agency officials. While serving as AFSA's retiree vice president, he worked to get the governing board involved in nominating Foreign Service retirees to serve on the Foreign Service Grievance Board. And as AFSA's secretary, Tom drafted popular amendments to the AFSA bylaws that are still benefiting us all to this day. We all know Tom and I think we can agree that few have done more for AFSA over the last 50 years uh, he richly deserves this award, and um, with this award, we salute him for the second time uh, for his contributions to AFSA, to the Foreign Service, uh, and I'd be very happy to turn the floor over to Tom for a few remarks. Tom? Distinguished awardees, colleagues, and friends, it's a great pleasure to be with you again. I would like to begin by thanking Eric for this, those kind words and to thank him and John Nalen and the other members of the AFSA Awards Committee and Board who voted me this singular honor. I would like to just say a couple of words about AFSA itself. As we all know, in two years, AFSA is going to celebrate its 100th anniversary as a professional organization and the 50th anniversary of its existence as a union. To be perfectly honest, the first 50 years of AFSA's existence uh, were not all that eventful and it wasn't in a position to, to deal with the major impacts of that era, the House on Affairs Activity, uh, Activities Committee and Senator McCarthy and their attacks on the Foreign Service as an institution and individual Foreign Service officers. Beginning with uh, our victory over the American Federation of Government Employees who dwarfed us in terms of their resources, human and financial, AFSA has begun a trajectory of dramatic growth and improvement and enhancement of its capabilities and its powers. In the beginning of that trip, in the early 70s, we had 8,000 members. Not only were we broke, but we were significantly in debt having just bought our headquarters building. We had no congressional uh, outreach effort nor did we have a public outreach effort. Today, AFSA has 16, more than 16,000 members. It negotiates personnel policies and procedures with the management of all of the foreign affairs agencies that have uh, foreign service members, state aid, commerce, uh, agriculture, and what is now used to be the Voice of America, the broadcasting stations. It also has, uh, can only be described as well off. We have a, what would be referred to in the business community as a fortress balance sheet. We could raise millions of dollars overnight if we had to. In addition, there is a more than $4 million uh, war chest which can be used by AFSA when it needs to do so to defend the Foreign Service or the, and the State Department or the people of the Foreign Service and State Department. We have a fully staffed and extraordinarily effective congressional uh, activity, which is bicameral and bipartisan and pound for pound, one of the best around. We have uh, an outreach program, uh, which has been enhanced by the digital revolution. 
And we are, in fact, in a position of extraordinary power, which can be used to defend the institutions and the individuals in the foreign affairs community. Those of us who have gone before and who developed and made all of this happen over a 50 year stretch. And you must remember that AFSA votes in a new list of officers and board every two years. The average lifetime of a generation of AFSA leadership is about three years. Accordingly, since those early years, we've had about 15 generations of AFSA leaders who have been extraordinarily successful in getting AFSA to where it is today. And I want to register that I accept this gift on behalf of all of them, and they number in the hundreds. The only other thing that I would like to do is to point out that having the capacity to defend the institution is not the same as have demonstrating the courage and the wisdom to actually defend the institution or individuals when they're under attack. I would like to recognize our two successor boards. First of all, Barbara Stevenson and her board and her team, the committee members and the staffers faced a situation in which the president of the United States in his first budget in 2017 uh, sought to achieve a 35% reduction in the 150 account, in the international account. I need hardly point out that defunding the Foreign Service would have defunded the nation's diplomatic capabilities with profound impacts on our national security. The challenge was that who was going, was who was going to defend the, the budget of the Foreign Service and the State Department in these circumstances? Certainly not the Secretary of State, the Deputy Secretaries and the Under and Assistant Secretaries were required by their positions to support the administration. So who was going to go to bat? Well, AFSA went to bat. And Barbara Stevenson and her uh, supporters and friends in, in a matter of weeks and may it out the outside months formed an informal uh, foreign service uh, caucus on the Hill, particularly in the Senate to defend our budget. And that was done successfully. It was done successfully in 2017, 18, 19, and 20, all four budgets. And on all four years, the Foreign Service and its allies and the Democratic and Republican parties on the Hill uh, denied the President of the United States and OMB in their efforts to damage the Foreign Service. I, I have said denied, but I'm thinking defeated. And that was a glorious demonstration of the use, the wise use of significant power that had been created. And then one year, this very year, one year ago, uh, President Trump uh, they embarked on a jihad against an individual Foreign Service officer, Maria Yovanovitch, the ambassador in Kiev, in the Ukraine. And her, what she was being attacked for was performing her duty, which is to defend the Constitution of the United States and not to defend a, a, the political campaign of a political president. And she was recalled, threatened and recalled and seemed to be in jeopardy. And AFSA charged to the rescue at the same time that the Trump administration and its friends were denigrating her. Uh, the American Foreign Service Association was publicly and uh, thoroughly and clearly defending her and her integrity as a foreign service officer and as a public servant. 
as a testimony to the degree to which our national outreach has been successful, AFSA in a period of days and a uh, group funding mechanism, mechanism raised three quarters of a million dollars. And no member of AFSA, and certainly not Ambassador Yovanovitch, spent a nickel on the serious legal problems that they had. And uh, that sends a message to the everybody concerned that AFSA can and will defend the institutions of the Foreign Service and the State Department and individual officers and uh, specialists serving those institutions. So I would just ask you to have some thoughts about AFSA's glorious present and its glorious past and hope and pray as I do that this past and present is but prologue for an equally glorious AFSA future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you for those uh, words, which mean a lot. They would mean a lot in any event, but coming from you, it, it especially means a lot to us. And I, I wanna salute you as well as uh, Bill for everything you've done over the past half century to build uh, AFSA both as a professional association and in the past 50 years as, as a union. And uh, thank you for recognizing our efforts on behalf of our members. We take that very seriously, really, as, as job one. And uh, it's been a trying time, but we're determined to, to rise to the occasion. So thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, congratulations again on receiving the award for a second time. Um, now I'd like to uh, present a special achievement award to AFSA's senior labor management advisor, James York. There's no one even within the halls of the State Department's management offices who knows more than James York does about the rules, regulations, and laws pertaining to travel, transportation, allowances, and assignments, among other issues. For over 25 years, James has been tenacious in advocating for our members who've been wronged by the system. Hundreds of members of the Foreign Service have been immeasurably helped by his sage counsel and calm demeanor. He is an AFSA treasure, and we are thrilled to be able to acknowledge his contributions over the past quarter century. James, congratulations, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. I really lucked into what turned out to be, a, in effect, a second career. And I'm really incredibly grateful to everyone who made it happen. Uh, Joe Melrose, who introduced me to AFSA like 29 years ago, and John Nayland, who rehired me again in 1999 and nominated me for this award. And to my colleagues in labor management for so many of those years, Sharon, Colleen, Zlatana, as well as many others who come and gone over the years and are too, too numerous to mention and many are still with us. I, I, I'm sure we do good work and I think and I'm, I'm very proud and honored to have been part of such a wonderful team for all these years and to have used those years to help many deserving Foreign Service members. Thank you again Eric and congratulations to Tom again for so, so much doing so much for AFSA over these years. Thank you. Excellent. Congratulations, James, and thank you uh, for everything. And just to be, be clear, James continues to contribute enormously to AFSA, but uh, we thought uh, this was a nice round number to honor him uh, for. So uh, thank you, James, and congratulations. Um, this year, uh, we are lucky enough to have two recipients of the AFSA Post Representative of the Year Award, and both happen to be USAID Foreign Service officers. Unfortunately, neither could join us today. Um, I believe uh, the outgoing counselor of the US Agency for International Development, Chris Milligan, is with us today. And AFSA's Vice President for USAID, uh, Jason Singer, uh, will accept these awards on behalf of both Charlie Doom and Randy Chester. So over to Jason. 
Great. Thank you very much, Eric. And, and congratulations to all of the well-deserved award winners today. Um, it is my honor to, to accept these awards on behalf of the uh, uh, co-recipients, uh, um, Ms. Charlie Doom and Mr. Randy Chester. Uh, I think we all know that the, the role of a post representative is, is one that can often be challenging as you are trying to represent your peers and your colleagues at, at the same time you are uh, conducting your day job. Um, and particularly in these trying times, uh, it is a critical role. Um, in the case of, uh, uh, of Charlie, uh, she was the AFSA rep in Oman from 2018 to 2020 and uh, really stood out on, uh, on behalf of AFSA members, representing them not only from, uh, for Oman Jordan, but in fact, her previous posts and other posts knew of her so much and her ability to act on behalf of AFSA members uh, that they reached out to her along the way as well. Um, and just in one case, she was instrumental in convincing uh, uh, personnel to re-examine their uh, actions in retaliation against officers who had sought to go on authorized duty as a result of the pandemic. You can only imagine some of the challenges. Um, so congratulations to Charlie. Uh, in the case of Randy Chester, uh, he really did serve as a, as a bridge to management, a mentor and a spokesman uh, for over 40 AFSA members in Pakistan. Again, a challenging post in the best of times, and you can imagine during the pandemic. Uh, he serves state as well as uh, USAID and all other foreign affairs agencies members as well. Um, he was instrumental in making the case for a number of members during unaccompanied uh, uh, evacuations um, and really did help to uh, articulate some of the challenges that individual members did not feel comfortable coming forward on their own. And in that sense, really helping to strengthen AFSA's position and engaging collaboratively, but very clearly with management. So again, it's my honor to accept uh, this award on behalf of Ms. Charlie Doom and Mr. Randy Chester. Thank you again. Thank you, Jason. And uh, let me just say that uh, in addition to congratulating our two recipients, I think uh, this award, the fact that both of our recipients are USAID Foreign Service Officers, is an important reminder that uh, AFSA is not just about the State Department Foreign Service. We represent our members in six US government departments and agencies, and we strive to represent them all uh, with equal commitment and vigor. So um, I'm, I'm very, very glad that the two of our post reps, uh, both of the ones we honored today, are from USAID. Uh, thank you. And now to present our final performance awards, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sushma Palmer to honor the recipients of the Mark Palmer Award for the Advancement of Democracy uh, in honor of Ambassador Mark Palmer. Uh, Dr. Palmer, over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Rubin. It's my pleasure to present the Mark Palmer Award for the Advancement of Democracy. We established the award in 2015 in honor of my late husband, Ambassador Mark Palmer, and his uh, lifelong passion for promoting democracy and human rights. Uh, the award, as you know, recognizes members of the US Foreign Services um, who embody bold and creative achievement and demonstrate imaginative, determined, and effective means to advance democracy and expand freedom in closed societies. The 2020 Palmer Award is shared by two distinguished uh, diplomats from among many outstanding candidates reviewed by our panel. The first is uh, Rafael Foley uh, for his extraordinary achievements as uh, Deputy Chief of Mission to the U.S. Mission to Venezuela. Mr. Foley successfully shaped and orchestrated initiatives of the Venezuelan opposition and the U.S. government to isolate the Maduro regime and undermine its traditional basis of support. He engaged a broad-based coalition to organize and energize the opposition. Furthermore, his insights played a key role in informing the US-sponsored democratic transition framework for Venezuela. Mr. Foley, it's my honor to present to you the 2020 Mark Palmer Award for the Advancement of Democracy Congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Palmer. I am really honored. I am um, 
personally humbled by the award. And at the same time, I'm very proud of receiving this award to the extent that this is an award, not to me, but to all the many officers from different agencies in the foreign service that have worked to uh, return the rule of law and democracy to Venezuela. I'm also honored to share this award with fellow Foreign Service Officer Alex Shima. The struggle for the rule of law and a return of democracy to Venezuela continues. We are committed as ever in succeeding. Um, the stakes are very high and this award represents really an inspiration and an endorsement of our efforts and also a, a boost of energy for us to continue on our path of uh, doing everything that we can to support and advance democracy. And of course, we are um, humble and we're very proud to come in the steps of so many other officers, uh, uh, colleagues, um, uh, mentors and uh, ambassadors like Ambassador Palmer his, himself in, in advancing democracy and in making sure that uh, democracy remains, the advancement of democracy remains a core value of, of US foreign policy and a core national um, uh, interest. So thank you, thank you very much for this award. Our, thank you, Mr. Foley. Our uh, second 2020 recipient, as you mentioned, is Alexandra Shima, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. But we recognize Ms. Shima's work as political officer in Embassy Kisinau in uh, Moldova. Her leadership and creative engagement with political leaders, the opposition and civil society played a decisive role in ridding, ridding Moldova of a feared autocrat. It helped strengthen Moldova's fledgling democracy by expanding opportunities for independent institutions to flourish. Furthermore, her work reinforced US leadership in Moldova's democratic development and empowered, <coughs> excuse me, empowered local institutions to combat Russia's malign actions. Congratulations, Ms. Shima. So um, I'm just wondering whether Ambassador, okay, I, I guess I go straight to, um, so the 2021 Palmer Award is given to Erica Kuhn for her extraordinary work as regional China officer at Embassy Prague. She championed strategies to counter China's anti-democratic activities and helped shape the U.S. response to China's decades-long campaign to isolate Taiwan and undermine its democratic government. Taiwan's uh, chief representative to the United States especially singled out Erica for her many achievements, including success in expanding Taiwan's relations with European democracies. Ms. Kuhn, it's my great pleasure to present you the 2021 Mark Palmer Award for the Advancement of Democracy. Congratulations. Hey, thank you, thank you. Sorry, that was a little technical glitch. Um, you know, I just wanna express my gratitude for this award. Um, definitely it's a group effort, but I think even more so than me as an individual or my embassy colleagues, actually the true heroes and the true people deserving of rewards are the Uyghur activists with whom I've had the privilege to cooperate, including Rushan Abbas, Dolkan Issa, who has been fighting for democracy since the 1980s in Xinjiang. And also um, Hamurat Harry, he's based now in Finland. There are so many Uyghurs who, um, actually the, the best way that I heard it put uh, is one Uyghur activist said to me, you know, I did not choose this. This was not my choice. I don't have the opportunity or the, or the chance to go back to my homeland. And this is something that the, the CCP forced me to do. I did not choose this life of advocacy. Similarly, I'm really heartened to see that now USG policy has become more supportive and more inclusive of Taiwan on the international stage. I actually first studied in Taiwan in a laundromat. I went to Taiwan as a poor university student. I had $700 to my name. And in that time, I really saw personally how how, how Taiwan has a thriving democracy. And I've, I'm so proud as a US citizen that our policy now fully supports the thriving democracy that is Taiwan. So this has been nothing but my privilege to work with both the local TECO offices, 
and Uyghur activists throughout Europe. So I really think that this, these, this kind of award really, I mean, my work pales in comparison um, in relation to the work that they have done. So I really feel so fortunate that our State Department is, has now um, put human rights at the center of our foreign policy, and I hope that we continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Palmer. Congratulations to both of our recipients. Uh, thank you for all the work you're doing to represent uh, our country's core values and to make a difference in the world. Uh, Dr. Palmer, thank you again for endowing this award uh, on behalf of Ambassador Palmer. And uh, now um, I would like to move on to our awards for constructive dissent. Uh, which is a unique program within the federal government and one that we at AFSA are very proud of. For over 50 years, AFSA has encouraged the tradition of constructive dissent within the Foreign Service. Uh, we believe that constructive dissent is absolutely critical to good policymaking, to defending our country's interest. Uh, and as a former recipient of one of these words myself, I take great pleasure in helping to honor our award winners today. Uh, so I have the honor of introducing first the winner of the w, w. Avril Harriman Award for Constructive Dissent by an entry-level Foreign Service Officer. And this year, our recipient is Lindsay Dana. hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, during her assignment as a Consular Officer in Bogota, Ms. Dana noticed that female visa applicants were asked to fill out fewer questions than male applicants, resulting in important information gaps for consular adjudicators. She worked with post management and the Bureau of Consular Affairs to push for a fix, resulting in a plan to equalize questions for all genders department wide, beginning in the spring of last year. Lindsay, uh, well, I'd like to invite you to uh, say a few words and congratulations. Thank you very much, Ambassador Rubin. I'd like to begin by thanking the 2019 consular team in Bogota, Colombia, who very supportively followed these changes along with me. Uh, and I thank AFSA as well for the recognition of this work and, and for this award, which I'm delighted to accept. Uh, if any entry level officers are, are watching, I wanted to say, I think we ELO, ELOs tend to inflate the idea of descent into something that's uh, too big or, or too difficult for someone at our level to pull off. But I hope this example shows you that you can do this. Uh, dissent can be big and high level and from positions of great leadership, as my fellow honorees after me will show you, but, uh, but it doesn't have to be. So I hope you will dissent uh, for change, which moves the department forward at this entry level and at every level of service you give to the department. I think many connotations around dissent can be negative, but constructive dissent for me, uh, to me, is very positive. It means being confident enough to ask the department to maybe take an uncomfortable look at itself in order to improve, uh, to better serve our public, or to better represent our interests abroad. And I think those who dissent within the department do so from a genuine place of understanding the role of diplomacy and uh, out of a very genuine want to make the State Department better. Uh, so in my, in my fellow colleagues who've exercised constructive dissent, I I see colleagues who respect the department and love their work as a diplomat. So I'm honored to be mentioned here along with them. And uh, from my heart, I appreciate the, the leadership and, and dedication that everyone recognized here has, has shown the department. So thank you again. And Ambassador Rubin, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. And congratulations again on making a real difference. Uh, and now I'd like to ask Robert Rifkin to present the William R. Rifkin Award for Constructive Dissent by a Mid-Level Foreign Service Officer uh, in honor of Ambassador William R. Rifkin. Uh, Mr. Rifkin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Rubin. Uh, I'd like to just very briefly preliminarily add my congratulations to Ambassador Boyat on his award. He's a longtime friend of our family and a treasure to the Foreign Service. For, for over 50 years, uh, my family's worked with AFSA to honor intellectual courage and constructive dissent by mid-level foreign service officers. 
My mother presented the first William R. Rivkin Award in 1968. And we now count among the distinguished recipients, some of the Foreign Service's most outstanding leaders, among them Tom Boyette, Ryan Crocker, Tex Harris, Jeffrey Pyatt, Anthony Quainton, Kenneth Quinn, AFSA's own Eric Rubin, and Joe Wilson. This year, we're pleased to honor two of the most recent Rivkin Award recipients. First, 2020 Rivkin Award winner, Jason Smith. Mr. Smith's intellectual courage and constructive dissent while serving in U.S. Embassy Jerusalem helped adjust U.S. policy on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. After the U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital and the release of the U.S. vision for peace in the last administration shifted decades of U.S. policy, Jason internally raised his concerns that Embassy Jerusalem was publicly expressing a preference in U.S. foreign policy for a specific religious narrative. When senior embassy leadership declined to alter this new terminology, Jason worked with colleagues to draft and send a dissent cable that prompted department leadership to find alternative language for use in addressing the conflict. Congratulations, Jason. Mr. Rivkin, thank you very much for your, your, your introductory words and for your support along with AFSA for uh, constructive dissent in the Foreign Service. And good evening, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow awardees. It is an honor to be here this evening and to share in recognizing the many accomplishments of our colleagues in foreign affairs, both those justly celebrated this evening and our colleagues who do similar work uh, without public recognition. Tonight, I wanted to share a few brief words about the importance of our voices representing the United States abroad and the value of expressing our opinions, especially when they differ in an effective way to advance US interests. Words are important, especially as diplomats. The children's rhymes, sticks and stones is unfortunately inaccurate. Words can hurt. And as diplomats representing the United States and American values, our choice of words, whether they are inclusive or exclusive and how they can be interpreted by the people in the countries where we work can have an immense impact, both good and ill, on our work to advance U.S. interests. All too often, foreigners will only know and judge us and our country by the words they hear. For some, including ourselves and our American and local colleagues abroad, words can have a personal and direct effect, impacting us in our day-to-day -day lives, especially if we feel those words do not reflect American values of inclusiveness and diversity, as events the last few years in the United States have shown to be so important to us as a nation. As diplomats, we can have an important role in shaping the words that represent us and our nation, and I had the opportunity to do so. I took away two key lessons from my experience expressing dissent. First, dissent can and should be empowering, and good leadership and trust in that leadership is, this, is critical to achieve that. Good leaders will take the time to listen to different perspectives, even if they don't agree with them, and they will support those individuals in expressing those views. Leaders can foster an environment where those under them feel comfortable expressing different perspectives. I personally felt empowered by leaders who took the time to listen and considered my concerns. My experience demonstrated to me the importance of dissent and multiple perspectives in the foreign policy process, irrespective of whether those expressing their views achieved the result they were hoping for. In and of itself, expressing dissent and being heard can be the achievement. Second, dissent does not need to be a solo journey. We do not need to be a lone voice in the wilderness. I was privileged to be able to work with a number of exceptional colleagues, both at Post and in Washington, who shared my concerns and joined with me in raising those concerns, not only overseas, but in Washington. As Americans, we know that when we are united, we stand. I am honored by being selected for this award, but must recognize and express my deep appreciation for those others who also raise their voices when needed and those who listen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'd now like to uh, present uh, the 2021 Rivkin Award winner, Annie Vu's uh, citation. While on detail to the National Security Council, 
Annie saw that multilateral standard setting bodies had become battlegrounds where China intended to assert its influence. Annie also understood that these institutions, if led properly, could be force multipliers of the rules-based international order supported by the United States. Senior political appointees in the International Organizations Bureau, however, did not perceive that threat, and one even tried to have Annie removed from the NSC for expressing her views. Annie refused to back down, but China's candidate nonetheless narrowly won the leadership of the UN Food and Agricultural Bureau, securing China's fourth UN specialized agency. But Annie used this loss to spotlight the threat of China's growing influence in international organizations. And when China nominated a candidate to head the World Intellectual Property Organization in the fall of 2019, Annie warned that China's reputation for stealing intellectual property meant a Chinese national leading the international uh, World Intellectual Property Organization would be like having the proverbial fox guarding the hen house. Annie led a whole of government process that ultimately helped Singapore's candidate win. Under Annie's leadership, this victory was institutionalized by IO as the model for working effectively with partners to ensure the preservation of US influence in international organizations. In fact, through her close collaboration with Australia in pushing back on China's influence in international organizations, Canberra has named its corresponding approach the Annie Vu policy process as a credit to her strategic vision. Uh, my understanding is that at the last minute, Annie couldn't be here today, but that AFSA State Vice President Tommy S. Garrity will accept on her behalf. Thank you very much, Mr. Rifkin. Uh, that's right. Unfortunately, Annie couldn't join us today, but she did ask me to read a, a statement on her behalf. First of all, let me say, Congrats to all the award recipients, with a special shout out to James York of my office, AFSA's Labor Management Office, uh, which does so much on both the uh, individual and collective level to help our members. So this is what Annie would like you to hear. Good afternoon and thank you to the American Foreign Service Association and to the Rifkin family for this honor. I had the privilege of working for Ambassador Charles Rifkin during my first assignment at Embassy Paris, so I am familiar with the legacy and dedication to service of the Rifkin family. My apologies that I'm not able to join you from the halls of the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. National security work is never ending, but I wanted to take a moment and express my appreciation for the William R. Rifkin Award and all that it stands for. I would like to first thank my NSC colleagues who not only encouraged me to speak out, <clears throat> but also taught me how to use the policy process as a means to dissent. It is no small task to try and reorient the way that our bureaucracy approaches the China challenge, and especially towards new policy objectives and new domains of competition. That, ta that task becomes even more daunting when there is active opposition by key stakeholders, especially in our own government. Throughout the process, my North Star remained the belief that what I was doing and what each and every one of us does every day must always be in the best interests of the United States and the vision of the world that we seek to uphold and at times defend. Thank you again for this honor. Eric, back to you. Thank you very much, Tom, and congratulations to all of our uh, recipients. And thank you again to uh, Mr. Rifkin and the Rifkin family uh, for honoring uh, constructive dissent uh, for so many years. Uh, it really is so important. And uh, now um, I would like to recognize the recipients of the Christian A. Herder Award for Constructive Dissent by a Senior Foreign Service Officer. The award is in honor of former Secretary Herder. Uh, and uh, Monica Smith, a USAID Foreign Service Officer, is our recipient. She strongly advocated for changing the way the USAID mission engaged in the Gaza water sector, giving the persuasive influence of Hamas in that sector. In doing so, she persistently challenged the approach of mission management at great personal cost. Her astute assessment of the risk of inadvertently providing assistance to a terrorist actor led to a significant change in the way the USAID mission operated in Gaza and the West Bank. 
Uh, congratulations, Monica, and let me invite you to say a few words. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rubin. It is truly an honor to have received this award on constructive dissent from AFSA. Thank you so much. Um, I hope that all of us, especially those working and living in the Foreign Service community, recognize that being a leader and a position, a person in a position of authority gives us a special responsibility to speak up and to encourage discussion of difficult issues and support our colleagues who do the same. The diversity of opinions fosters diversity in action. John Lewis was an inspirational man who lived by this very creed. I'd like to take the opportunity to quote from him. And he said, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. This advice has had a significant impact on me and my career. And I hope to continue to get into some good trouble from time to time. I'd like to take this opportunity also to thank Sybil Sigler for nominating me and joining me into getting into that good trouble. And thank you to AFSA for doing so much for foreign service officers over all the years. Back to you, Ambassador Rubin. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Monica. That's uh, just fantastic work and, and very courageous work as well and uh, it underlines the importance of having our people on the ground sharing what they know uh, with the people who are making the policy decisions. So thank you and congratulations. Um, and our final award for the day, uh, I'm sorry, we have one more before we do final award, I apologize. Uh, we have a second recipient for our Senior uh, Constructive Dissent Award. Should not jump ahead, sorry about that. Uh, and it's someone I know well, our second recipient is Julie Stuff, who is, was a member of the National Security Council staff serving during the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And during that time, Julie advocated for protection of and advocacy for and unimpeded travel by US citizens abroad. In the early days of the pandemic, uh, Stuff advocated policies initially viewed as unthinkable but which proved essential in limiting the spread of COVID-19. Many of these provisions, such as global travel advisories, repatriation of US citizens, and advisories for those traveling on cruise ships were eventually adopted by the executive branch. Uh, Julie, congratulations, and uh, please join us to say a few words. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rubin, and uh, thank you, AFSA, for your recognition through this important award, and congratulations to the other recipients. Um, in a true full circle foreign service moment, I'd just like to say that of the leaders and mentors uh, who have imparted many things to me through my career about the best ideals of the foreign service, Eric Rubin, uh, as my DCM in Moscow when I was ACS chief, uh, taught me the value of how we interact with American citizens overseas and how we are an integral part of their protection um, and often under very challenging circumstances that he and I sometimes face during that tour. So I'm thrilled that, uh, that you, Eric, are in AFSA leadership today. For reasons that were outlined best, I think, by Ambassador Negroponte, uh, I really would encourage and hope that any Foreign Service officer will choose to pursue the privilege of working on behalf of the department at the National Security Council at some point in their career. Um, there is a deep and abiding need to have foreign service expertise to be part of the group that directly provides advice to the President of the United States. Um, my greatest satisfaction in this role was to see how others perceive the foreign service when encountering us for the first time, uh, almost universally with astonishment at what we do and what we contribute. I have seen frequently domestic-based uh, interagency colleagues marvel at the construction of a good reporting cable and I've seen political appoint appointees with no foreign policy experience 
understand instinctively our commitment to American citizens and informing and protecting them around the world and offer their support as my nominator did. If the lion's share of constructive dissent is to represent our foreign service and educate others on our perspective, I was fortunate, very fortunate to have had that opportunity during that assignment. Um, it's clear to me from this ceremony today that families are the beating heart of our foreign service. So I want to honor the hearts of my foreign service family, my husband, Tim, my children, Oliver, Nora, and Millie, as well as my parents watching from Ohio who took me on my first overseas trips. Love you guys. Thank you. Congratulations, uh, Julie. And uh, I, I also have fond memories of working with you in Moscow in support of the very many American citizens who needed our help. Uh, it's the kind of place where that happens, unfortunately, all too often. Uh, but it's, it's really job one for all of us. Um, and thank you for the contributions you made. And let me just second your views about working on the NSC staff. It's, it's really critical. And I'm pleased to say we have a lot of senior directors and directors from the Foreign Service now, once again, uh, at the NSC. So thank you. Uh, congratulations. Uh, and now we can move to our final award, uh, which is the F. Allen Tex Harris Award for Constructed Dissent by a Foreign Service Specialist. This is in honor of the late uh, Tex Harris, also one of the founders of our modern association and an inspiration and role model to so many of us. And I'd like to invite Ambassador Harrop back uh, to present that award. Bill? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, the Tex, Tex Harris Award is, uh, is really, uh, I think, an important one because we had those three awards for constructive dissent on the part of of junior officer, middle grade officer, and uh, senior officer, but we do not have one for a foreign service staff officer. And we now have that, and I think it's a, it's a, a step forward uh, for AFSA to have made that uh, arrangement. Uh, Tex Harris and Tom Boyat, whom we heard from a short time ago, I must say that was a very eloquent historical summary you did, Tom. Uh, the three of us, and colleagues worked very hard 50 years ago uh, to bring about the uh, AFSA representative labor role that it now enjoys along with the professional role. This is an important, important achievement. Tex Harris was a very important backer of AFSA for his whole career. In fact, his telephone his email address was AFSA Tex, which seemed to be quite appropriate. At any rate, uh, this is uh, his award, and I'm very pleased that it's being uh, given to David Heddleston, who was a supervisory special agent uh, in the uh, diplomatic security at, at present uh, assigned to Washington. Uh, his uh, dissent Often these dissents are in the form of a, of a suggestion for improvement or an effort to get something done within the system that you can't get done in the ordinary way, so you file a dissent channel message. And that's what David did. Like many others of these that we've had in the past of constructed dissent uh, awards, uh, this one seems so obvious, it's hard to really understand why it required a dissent channel message and a special constructive dissent effort to get it achieved. Uh, Heddleston felt that there should be a vehicle uh, assigned, a government vehicle assigned to diplomatic security representatives overseas for use in unexpected emergency requirements uh, off hours. Now that would seem to be a pretty obvious idea. In fact, the overseas representatives of the FBI, the DEA, and the ICE all have this. And to cap it off, even diplomatic security officers back in the United States who have uh, responsibilities uh, uh, for uh, uh, protection and uh, investigative uh, uh, affairs have such a vehicle assigned to them. 
Well, this was uh, David Huddleston's suggestion, and I believe that he can confirm this for it. I believe it's been accepted. Uh, and it's, uh, it's an obvious need for security officers overseas who are, I would think, more likely to have emergency requirements for a vehicle at night than those back in the United States. They should have such a vehicle, and I think it was a, a very good dissent suggestion. Congratulations to you, David, for doing a good common sense thing. Oh, thank you, Ambassador. Sorry, I'm on the run here. Um, and thank you for, for your many years of service improving America's diplomacy. I'm humbled and honored for the opportunity to, to accept the 2020 F. Allen Tex Harris Award on behalf of my Foreign Service Specialist colleagues, most specifically my Diplomatic Security Sp Service Special Agents. Tex mentioned <laughs> that he made a career out of being a pain. And I envision that my current past leadership and probably even their leadership smirking with me reflecting Texas assertion, because I'm sure I too have been a pain in my own efforts to improve how we conduct business. The timing of this award is even more poignant as the American Foreign Service Association selected me as a recipient for this award in the same year that Tex passed away on February 23rd, 2020. After several years of voicing the horrific conditions of the Argentinian military junta in the late 1970s, Tex ultimately received recognition for his brave and honorable descent, but not without first facing resistance and career hindering penalization from the embassy and department leadership. I'm grateful for Tex's service, bravery, and commitment to leveraging constructive dissent for the betterment of humanity. I prepared remarks to highlight the activities following submission of my dissent cable. However, the speech I prepared did not complete the clearance process through the Bureau of Diplomatic Security in time for this ceremony. So in brief, congratulations to my fellow award winners and thank you to the American Foreign Service Association for recognizing impactful and meaningful dissent. Thanks very much, David. Uh, I think, uh, Eric, I think we're all going to be very pleased to give you the opportunity to close this <laughs> wonderful yet long event. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Bill. Uh, and uh, congratulations, David. And thank you for your uh, courage in speaking up uh, in the tradition of Tex Harris. And thank you for that shout out to Tex and what he meant to all of us and the model that he set. And I think uh, uh, making good trouble is uh, one of the most important things we can do uh, in serving our country. Uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And let me uh, say that, yes, um, we can uh, declare that this award ceremony uh, is over. We really hope we'll be able to do it in person in the Atchison Auditorium uh, as we have in the past next year. We're very sorry that uh, we couldn't for the second year in a row, but we're deeply grateful for the opportunity to use this technology to honor uh, all these wonderful people and their wonderful accomplishments. I wanna thank all of our presenters, uh, everyone who helped make this possible, our staff at AFSA who worked to put this together under difficult conditions and on behalf of our nearly 17,000 members, uh, I wanna say uh, thank you to everybody who contributes to uh, our association who works to make the Foreign Service stronger, healthier and better able to serve our country. And with that, um, I wanna wish everyone a good evening. Congratulations again to our recipients and I hope to see everyone soon. Thank you, have a good night. <laughs>